Jacob Goldstein is an executive producer and host at Pushkin Industry. He's also the author of a book called Money, the True Story of a Made-Up Thing. In this conversation, we talk about his book. We talk about stable coins, inflation rates, the gold standard, and much more. I really enjoyed this conversation with Jacob, and I hope that you enjoy it as well. Before we get into this episode, though, I want to quickly talk about our sponsors. Today's episode is brought to you by Copper. Since 2018, Copper has been at the forefront of institutional digital asset development. From award-winning custody solutions to creating the first truly off-exchange settlement function, Copper pioneers technology, products, and services in lockstep with a rapidly changing world. No other infrastructure provider covers as many assets across as many exchanges with the speed and security that Copper can offer. To learn how Copper helps the world's largest institutional investors secure their digital assets, head over to copper.co. Again, Copper, the unfair advantage. Check them out at copper.co today. Next up is Compass Mining. Compass Mining is the world's largest marketplace for mining hardware and hosting. With Compass, everyone can mine Bitcoin. Their team makes it easy to start mining wherever you want, at home or in one of their 23 hosting facilities around the world. Through the Compass Marketplace, retail miners can access mining hardware with similar prices and purchase plans as the world's largest mining companies. Compass miners own their machines, they choose whatever mining pool they want, and they mine directly to their own wallets. Miners who don't want to host their machines can order ASICs directly to their doorstep. Simple and low-cost hosting agreements coupled with best-in-class customer service are the reasons why Compass is the simplest and most popular way to mine Bitcoin. Start mining your own Bitcoin today by visiting compassmining.io. Again, compassmining.io. Go check them out and let me know what you think. This episode is brought to you by Bullish. Bullish is a powerful new digital asset exchange built for institutions that delivers the innovations of DeFi in a regulated environment. The Bullish Hybrid Order Book pairs the high performance of a traditional central limit order book with the automated market making. Powered by deep bullish liquidity pools backed by the multi-billion dollar bullish treasury. So you can trade with certainty and at scale across variable market conditions. You can learn more at bullish.com or follow Bullish on Twitter because the future belongs to the bullish. Now, this is not investment advice. Digital assets and cryptocurrencies are high-risk products. Consult your professional advisor before dealing in them. Bullish services are available in select locations only and not to U.S. persons. Visit bullish.com slash legal for important information and risk warnings. Go check them out at bullish.com or follow at bullish on Twitter. All right, let's get in this episode. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. Anthony Pompliano runs Pomp Investments. All views of him and the guests on his podcast are solely their opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Pomp Investments. You should not treat any opinion expressed by Pomp or his guests as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow a particular strategy, but only as an expression of his personal opinion. This podcast is for informational purposes only. Jacob, how are you doing? I'm good. I've got a lot of questions for you. Uh, You're a legend for writing a book, literally money, the true story of a made up thing. Let's start with the book first. Uh, Why are you interested in money? And like, why is that the perspective that you ended up with uh, of basically saying, hey, this is just like this made up thing that society adopted? I mean, money, as you know, from your work, right? Like, it's amazing. And it's a great way to look like, not just at, you know, how do I buy the stuff I need? How do I live a comfortable life? But a great way to look at like, how society works, right? How do people decide to to move stuff around, to do exchange? So like, it's just this incredible story you can see for long periods of time. And then when you study the history, you get a new sort of perspective on what's happening now. I mean, one of the things I'm curious to get your views on is stable coins, because I have all these like historical references from my from my writing. And I'm like thinking, well, are stable coins like these weird dollar bills we had in the 1800s? Are they like money market mutual funds? I think they kind of are. So yeah, it's great. There's a ton of stuff there. So when you think about, let, let's talk about money and we'll talk about stable coins here in a second. But when you, when you think about money, how much of the money today is this like belief system, right? You and I agree that this piece of paper or this electronic uh, Q-SIP has value and therefore we're willing to exchange it back and forth. But that's a new thing. And actually the money of 50 plus years ago didn't have a belief system tied to it as more so commodity based. Like, do you make a, a difference between whether it's the gold standard or some other uh, kind of form of commodity based money uh, elsewhere in history uh, to fiat? Or has it always just been a belief system? It's just whether there was a physical good or not, but it's still a belief system. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, 
You know, it doesn't have to be as binary, I think, as you're framing it, right? Like, it definitely is striking how recent the fiat world is, right? Money is thousands of years old. And with really a few exceptions, it was always, almost always commodity based for thousands of years until essentially the Depression, right? When even that commodity sort of underpinning got got taken away when, when the world went off the gold standard. So on one level, it's even more belief-based now. But on another level, like gold is not inherently useful, right? Like it's not like it was like a, a wheat-based standard. It was like, okay, I know I can eat if I trade in my dollar bills for wheat, right? So gold itself, the, the idea that commodity-based money is somehow real is not quite true either, right? The value of gold is, is made up, right? It just comes from this sort of abstract desire. And so when you think about that, how – do you evaluate Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, right? What just as like an industry, is it something where it should replicate what's already been going on in history? Do you look at it as something that no, actually kind of uh, diverging or creating like a bifurcated offering is, is where the value lies because money isn't working right now. Like what's the lens or the, the framework you use to evaluate uh, kind of the current industry in, in, in the current state? I mean, at the sort of broadest level, the, you know, what the historical context tells me is like, is this, Whatever the monetary regime is at some given moment, right, whether it's like the gold standard or fiat or whatever, most people at most times just think whatever money is, is like a fact in the world, right? They don't think it's like this made up set of rules, which is what it always is. They think, oh, it's just like nature, right? It's just like water flows downhill. We have governments creating fiat currency, whatever. People assume it's real, right? And the key insight for me, I think, is no, no, it's always made up and you can always have a new regime, right? So at the broadest level, like crypto is a plausible new regime. Like, I don't know that it's going to become money, that it's going to displace the current regime we have, but it definitely could. And eventually something will. Right. And so to me, the big insight is like there is, you know, the way money works now is not natural. It's always made up and something will always come along and be the new made up thing. So I want to use two examples. Uh, one is a historical example and one is kind of a modern example. Uh, the rise of coins in ancient Greece. I know you talk about that in uh, in the book. And I think a lot of people, for whatever reason, uh, I would call it nostalgia, except for none of us were alive then. Uh, they just Deep think it's interesting. Yeah, right? yeah, they yeah. just think it's interesting, right? Um, walk us through kind of like, what, what are the important things that people should take away from that time period in terms of what money was and how that's informed our relationship with money today? I like that. Yeah, that's a deep cut. So that's like, oh, what, about 600 years BC? So we're thousands of years ago now, right? And and it's really the first thing we today would recognize as money was these coins. So they emerge in the Eastern Mediterranean, actually this, this uh, kingdom in Turkey that gets wiped out, but, but the Greeks go really crazy for coins. And Coins are great for the Greeks for this reason. Before the Greeks came along, there wasn't really like a fully monetized society, right? So you had a couple different ways of, of sort of, you know, doing trade, right? You had these big kingdoms that were very top down, right? Where there would be like a priest or a king and it would be like a command and control economy today, right? The priest or the king would basically be like, okay, I'm going to take this stuff from this farmer and I'm going to give it to this guy over here, right? There wasn't a market economy really. On the other hand, you had like really small sort of tribal type societies where everybody knew each other and they had like kind of rules for, you know, I'm going to lend this to you. You're going to lend that to me. Exchange work that way. So the Greeks, you know, as we know, right, they're like the cradle of democracy. Um, and they were too big to do the like tribal, oh, kumbaya, we're all going to lend stuff to each other. But they were also too sort of free to have a top down, like the king's going to say who gets what, right? So what they needed was money, right? They needed a way to do exchange in a big, complicated society where nobody controls everything. And coins come along and they're like the perfect thing for Greece. So that's a nice place to kind of start the money story and think about what it does for us. It, it, it's so funny how like the physical coin is the thing that we still think about today. Amazing, uh, right? Amazing. Like yeah. there, there's literally people born today who won't touch a coin for a decade, right? Like, yeah. like and it, why would you, right? Like 
why would you? It's more trouble than it's worth. <laughs> so I think that's a huge piece of it. Uh, and I also find it uh, hilarious that uh, some people may remember, I think it was Kyle Bass is one person. There was a couple of others. Uh, Kyle Bass is a macro investor. He bought like a million dollars worth of nickels because he thought hmm. that the nickel in the nickel would actually be worth more over yeah, time. Yeah, the ARB. Well, that's happening again right now, yes. right? The price of nickel is going through the roof. And so a nickel is definitely worth more than a nickel. If you can, you know, you got to get the nickel out of it. Is yes. The Part, right? And, and uh, for anyone who thinks that they should run and go buy a bunch of nickels, it is illegal to destroy the nickel. So, so please be careful. <laughs> so you didn't hear it here. Not investment <laughs> advice. But but it is interesting to think about this idea of the commodity itself could be worth more than what the actual coin itself is pegged to. That was actually a problem for like hundreds of years, you know, in the whatever, 17th century ish, when countries were on the gold standard and the silver standard. And they would, you know, the government would try and set an exchange rate between gold and silver. But there was always a market price. Price, right. And they were always getting the market price wrong. So people would be like getting silver in England and taking it over to Europe and melting it down and selling it like it's quite hard to do sort of top down monetary stuff. I completely agree. The modern example I want to talk about is this idea of shadow banking. I think a lot of yeah. people have heard that term uh, or that phrase. They have no clue what that means. What What is it? And like, why is it important for people to understand shadow banking in today's day and age? Yeah. Shadow banking is super interesting. So if you think of like the most simple basic thing a bank does, right, is basically you go and put your money there for safekeeping, and then the bank turns around and lends out your money to somebody else and collects interest, right? That is like banking, you know, 1.0. The simplest thing banks do, they still do it. So um, regulated banks do it, they're just banks. But what keeps happening, again, this is another thing you keep seeing through history, right? Banks get regulated for some set of reasons, basically because banks have this unique ability to sort of create money and blow up the economy. And people are like, why is this bank screwing me over? So they get regulated. And then what happens is other institutions come along. So if you go back to say the 1970s, right? Uh, out of the depression, since the depression, there had been caps on how much interest banks could pay. Uh, and so these basically two guys, just these two finance guys were like, well, what if we start something where we take people's money and we give them a little more interest and we take their money and we lend it out for really safe things? You know, we'll we'll buy treasury bonds or even like jumbo CDs in a bank. And so they called that a money market mutual fund, right? You, lots of people have money in money market funds today. Not technically a bank, not regulated like a bank, but doing the basic banking thing, right? It's kind of a regulatory arbitrage. So this gets bigger and bigger in the like end of the 20th century, basically. It grows into this multi-trillion dollar business, shadow banking. This like doing what banks do, borrowing and lending, taking deposits, lending it out. And it ends up driving the rise of finance in the like early aughts, right? The housing bubble and Wall Street getting giant. And then when we have the, the financial crisis in 2008, there's a run on the shadow banking system. Everybody's like, I want to take my money out of the money market mutual fund and all these other weird financy things that are bank like. And of course, these uh, institutions didn't have deposit insurance. And, you know, when there's a run, when everybody comes and says, I want my money right now, the money market mutual fund and all the other shadow banks say what? Banks always say in a run, we don't have your money. We lend it out. We loaned it out. And then they're trying to sell and it's a fire sale. And that was a huge part. And I think an undercovered part of the economic collapse of 2008. And so in that moment, is it fair to say that like the belief system or the made up part gets exposed or like people lose confidence. And so when you lose the confidence game, then all of a sudden that's where you increase the odds of these bank runs or, or the runs on the uh, money market funds. Absolutely. I mean, bank runs. And like the weird thing is if you think like, even if I trust my bank, if I think everybody else is going to go and try and get their money out of the bank, it's rational for me to be like, oh, shit, I better get there before all the money is gone. Right. Sorry, I cursed. Um, and, and I'll say and I don't know if this is what you're walking up to, but like the Bitcoin white paper came out in what Halloween 2008. Right. Like one month after Lehman Brothers went bankrupt. Like, that's not a coincidence. And when you read the stuff Satoshi is writing at that time, it's all like, hey, we don't trust the banks. Let's try and find out something new. And even the, the Genesis block, right, that comes out in early 2009, still right in the teeth of the crisis. As you probably know, in the Genesis block, which is just code, right? You look at it. It's just code, code, code. But off to the side, there's this headline from a British paper, I think the Times of London, about a bank bailout, right? So like, Correct. I don't know if you were walking up to that, but it's right there. 
Yeah, it, it, it's uh, it reminds me a lot of when you talk about the bank runs uh, during the pandemic. If you went to the grocery store and you were like, oh, there's no milk, there's no bread, there's no masks like shit. I need toilet paper. I need yeah. bread. I need milk. Like, like like you just get this feeling of like, what does everybody else know that I don't know? And similar thing with uh, with money on the bank runs. And then to your point, Bitcoin was built uh, or at least launched during the global financial crisis. Uh, and, you know, I, you'd be hard pressed to convince me that it didn't have anything to do with the global financial crisis happening at the same time. I mean, certainly, I mean, the technology people had been working toward that for like 20 years by that point, right? Like there's a great backstory about the cypherpunks and people trying to figure out this really hard tech technical problem, right? How do you make digital money on the internet that people can't just copy and paste and where you know everything. And like, you see them solving like problem after problem. They hadn't quite solved them all until the Bitcoin white paper, but it is like for marketing purposes, amazing timing for Bitcoin. For sure. What what about stable coins? Like, I know that you've spent a lot of time kind of thinking about this. There's this idea that like, oh, it's just a currency, right? Just like the dollar or anything else. Then there's an idea of like, oh, wait, maybe these are like new versions of money market funds. Like, how do you evaluate what stable coins are and, and their role in the global financial markets? Yeah. And I mean, you know, this is one where you, you almost certainly know more about the sort of day to day of it than I do. But when I look at it from this like historical perspective, it does look to me like like a kind of shadow banking, right? Like if you think about what a stable coin is, it's like, I give them a dollar and they say to me, okay, you can have your dollar back anytime you want. And then they take my dollar and they, in many cases, lend it out, right? They'll, they'll maybe, uh, you know, buy commercial paper. They'll lend it out to a, to a corporation for a short term, for a month or something. But still, if everybody comes and wants their dollar back at the same time, the stable coin issuer is not going to have it, right? And so that is a like a fundamentally precarious thing, it seems to me. But I'm curious. I mean, do you think that's right? I mean, I think it's a, a version of it for sure. Uh, what you ultimately have to look at is like, what are they doing? And in some way, uh, you could describe it as shadow banking. Another way you could talk about it is just like it's upgrading the technology of the assets, right? So I think a lot about uh, let's say that you have physical dollars and you go and you give them to the bank. And the bank literally then gives you electronic QCIP based dollars in some like very elementary uh, or barbaric analysis. They just gave you a technology upgrade. It's the same asset. It's supposed to still represent one dollar, has the same purchasing powers, still subject to the same monetary policy. It's just they upgraded your technology from analog to electronic QCIP. Yeah. In yeah, some yeah. way now you can take that electronic QCIP and go and upgrade it to the digital form, which is are these stable coins. And there's variations between each one of them and uh, l different levels of trust and regulation and auditing and, and whatever. But like the physical payment rail sucks, right? Yeah, like, yeah. like right now, if you're like, hey, give me a dollar, like it will take me a while to get you a physical you know, ACA, dollar. Like it takes days, right? It's amazing. And like, I did a story about this eight years ago or something. And they're like, no, we're going to fix it. We're going to fix it. And like, still it sucks. Right? Yeah. So, so it's like physical sucks. Then you get to like the electronic Q-SIPs, wires, ACHs, all that, that sucks. Yeah. And yeah. stable coins are, in, in my opinion, the single best way to move dollars around the world today. It's cheaper, it's faster, it's more internationally accessible, et cetera. And so you've just gotten a technology upgrade over time. Now, the question is, is that a technology upgrade exclusively? Does it empower a continuation or evolution of shadow banking? Like, like what are the implications? And, and frankly, I don't know if we have those answers yet. Like, like there's still yeah. a lot of work here and we're just watching it play out. I mean, it's clearly runnable, right? Like they're engaging in maturity transformation, right? They're taking, they're t they're taking my dollar and saying, I can have my dollar at a moment's notice. And then they're lending it out to people who aren't going to pay it back for a month or something, right? Not all of them, but some of them are doing that. And like, and you know, there's a universe where it's like just a few people are doing that and whatever, caveat emperor. You know, if those people can't get their money back, I don't care. They took a risk. It's not my problem. But I do feel like there's some size, right? At some point, stable coins will be big enough where there will be a crisis and there will be a run on them and, and they'll be big enough that they can do damage to the broader economy, right? That they can sort of hurt innocent bystanders. And so when you get to that point, it does seem worth thinking like in the same way that we have, you know, deposit insurance and lots of rules about money market mutual funds, which like aren't great rules, by the way, in many ways. But uh, it does seem worth thinking about like, okay, what are the risks to people who aren't involved and how do we mitigate those risks, right? Like, I mean, a simple move is like if, a stable coin beyond a certain size, market cap, whatever, had to keep the money in, you know, uh, in a reserve account at the Fed or even in like short term treasuries, which, 
which are super liquid, right? Like that would be way safer. So I don't know. It'll be interesting to see uh, how it shakes out. It does seem like a new technology on like a super old move, right? It's like the most ancient banking move in the world strapped onto this 21st, techno uh, 21st century technology. Some people kind of argue that's the value. Some people argue that's the danger, right? It's kind of, it both, cuts both right? ways. It could be yeah. both. Like <laughs> Absolutely. a lot of technology is like super useful and then maybe could blow up. I've got two of my brothers here with me. Uh, I think they've got questions for you as well. Joe, what you got? Jacob, thanks for coming on. Uh, I think most Bitcoiners would agree, obviously, that money only exists and has value because we believe in it, right? But there are a lot of people in the world who are not Bitcoiners and do not have any idea about this. How do you explain to them the concept that money is just made up kind of in short two to three or four sentences? Well, I mean, fiat makes it pretty obvious, right? Like, a dollar is literally just a piece of paper. You could start with that, right? And then you could say most dollars aren't even a piece of paper. Like today we might think of a coin like you were saying, but we might think of a piece of paper, but like the vast majority of money is literally just an entry on a bank computer. Like that's it, there's nothing there. There's nothing beneath it, right? I mean, the one other way to think of it that is interesting is I do feel like, you know, because money today is so attached to the nation state, right? Like really the US dollar is a bet on the United States economy as a going concern, right? So that's another way to think of it. Although I think I've gone beyond the boundaries of your question. I don't know if I just <laughs> no. convinced the person. You, you, you might've hit 10, 10 sentences, but that works for me. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> John, what do you got? Jacob, we talked a lot about the history of money. Can you talk about what do you think the future of money is and like, what does it look like? Is it Bitcoin? Is it not? Like, what are your thoughts there? I mean, I got to say, you know, so I started covering Bitcoin in, I don't know, 2011, early enough that like I was shocked in the middle of the story that it went from $10 of Bitcoin to $20 of Bitcoin. I was like, wait, am I reading that wrong? It can't be $20 of Bitcoin. And, and you know, at that time, it felt more likely that Bitcoin was going to be money, like actually what people use to buy stuff, weirdly than it does today, right? Like, I feel like there's some way in which the rise in the price of Bitcoin makes it less like money, right? It's more like a like an asset. Um, so it doesn't seem to me in the short term like Bitcoin itself is going to be money. But I don't know. I mean, the big lesson for for me from studying history is to be is to be humble, right? Is to say like I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm not going to get cocky and say, oh well, surely what we have today as money is going to be money forever. I do think the nation states really going to hold on tight, right? Like I don't think countries are going to want to give up their their power over money. So it'll be interesting to see that tension, right, between the sort of private stateless Bitcoin and, and other cryptocurrencies versus states. And, you know, we're seeing that sort of negotiation happen. And that's really going to be interesting to watch that play out. Well said. Jacob, I know that you've got a new podcast coming out. It's not just about money. Uh, you basically are talking to engineers, innovators, entrepreneurs, et cetera. Uh, how do you select who comes on? I, I don't know if I'm allowed to say what the first two or three episodes are, but it, it's it. like- Yeah, and say the name. It's called What's Your Problem? It launches- uh Tomorrow that, launches on Thursday, March seventeenth. That, that, that's there a guy, that's a guy who knows how to promote a podcast. Right there, <laughs> he said, "Say the name, boy." <laughs> so, so when, I, I'm not boy. Boy is your word, sir. <laughs> say the name, please, sir. What's your problem? So, so, when we look at episode one, it says building a drone delivery business. Episode two, the guy who made thirty million dollars selling dog ramps, and then episode three is teaching cars to drive themselves uh, is hard. That, that's a very, very different uh, collection of uh, of people to talk to. Like, how do you come? up with what you want? Is it just your personal interest or something else? Yeah. I mean, the the guy selling ramps to wiener dogs is kind of a little bit out of the, the mainstream of the show. The, the basic idea of the show is like, you know, we're in this moment of incredible technological progress, as you, as you guys know. And a lot of that technological progress is coming coming from entrepreneurs, right? Coming out of the private sector. There are all these businesses that are like out at the frontier trying to figure out, you know, how do you do drone delivery? How do you get cars to drive themselves? How do you teach people a new language for free on an app, whatever. And like, these are big, exciting questions. And so I'm trying to find people who are actually working on those things out at the frontier. Yeah, and when you start to think about this, like what is the goal so somebody goes ahead and listens to this. Is it to be educated, entertained, both? Is it for them to be inspired to go and start uh, their own company or build their own product? Like, how, how do you measure what the uh, the success looks like here? Yeah, I think the first two things you said were were like uh, right on it. Uh, 
educated and entertained, right? Like I always wanted to be like a little bit funny or just like not too taking itself seriously, but I also want to like really get into it, right? I feel like you hear a lot of interviews with people and they're like, oh, everything's fine. It's going to be great. But the thing I really want to get at is like, what is the actual hard problem? Like, what are you actually trying to solve? Because I feel like if you can really get a sense of that, and it's for a general audience, right? It's not like, I'm not like some technical person, but I think if you can get a sense of that, you really get a sense of like, where are we right now? And what is the frontier and what's coming next? So it's, you know, understanding the world in particular through the lens of business in a way that's like somewhat light. Fun. Yeah, that makes sense. Last thing I want to talk to you before we let you go uh, is we can't talk about money without talking about inflation. Uh, 7.9% in the United States, allegedly. Uh, now 5.7% uh, allegedly in Canada. What, what's your take on all this? Like how, how off are the official verse, like maybe the, the real uh, experience of people, uh, whether it's in America, Canada or elsewhere. And then ah, what can they do? Like does the Fed just have to hike rates to the moon before they can get this under control? Or how do you uh, evaluate it? Yeah. I mean, you know, one of the things just like it was amazing how low inflation was for how long. Right. Like, you know, this whole sort of decade, last decade, as I was covering the economy, you know, it would be like, OK, uh, unemployment went down some more. Oh, and deficits are still high. Like, surely we're going to have inflation now. Right. Nope. Still one point eight percent. So like kind of amazing how long it took to get here. I mean, in terms of what happens next, historically, it's a little bit grim, right? Traditionally, what happens when inflation gets this high and persists is the Fed raises interest rates until there is a recession and inflation comes back down. So I don't know what's going to happen, but certainly if it's like what's happened before, it's the Fed will raise interest rates, there will be a recession, unemployment will go up, and inflation will come down. Yeah, it um uh it, it just feels like the world is uh uh full of uncertainty chaos uh it's falling apart but it's also the safest most prosperous time in human history like th there's just so much cognitive dissonance I think going on uh that people ultimately just throw their hands up and say I don't know right I, I yeah. really really don't know yeah I mean it's weird right like weird it's that's a good weird. that's actually a very yeah. very good term it's weird. <laughs> Yeah. And then you didn't even mention the pandemic, right? Like all this and like technological breakthroughs and like weirdly, you know, household savings is way up. Unemployment is down, but like the pandemic still isn't quite over. So it's super weird. I, I completely agree. Where can we send people to find you on the internet? Um, I, if people want to learn more about other things you're doing or, or follow along as you release more podcast episodes, where can we send them? Yeah, I'm on Twitter, just at Jacob Goldstein, just my name. All right. That's pretty and good. What's, listen to what's your problem? What's your problem? Do, is there a, a website? Oh, like a uh, URL? just Google it. I mean, pushkin.fm is uh, pushkin is the is the company that makes it. But Jacob Goldstein, what's your problem? What's your problem? That, that could go two ways. What's your problem? Like, what problem are you trying to solve? Or when I see my brothers in the street and I say, hey, bro, what's your problem? What, hey, what? hey, I'm walking in. <laughs> Money, the true story of a made up thing. Jacob, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and hopefully we'll bring you back in the future. Uh, you got a lot of great ideas. And I'm super excited for the podcast launch tomorrow. Hey, thanks so much. It was great to talk with you guys.